Alcohol in the Bible. This is one of the most debated topics in religious circles today. Let's explore this topic. The temperance movement began in the United States around the late 1700s, with the movement really gaining steam in the 1830s. Church leaders and political groups formed activist organizations in most states by the end of the 1830s. I have no doubt that these organizations that wanted to target drunkenness and lewd behavior among the population had the best intentions in mind. However, what resulted in most Protestant denominations was new doctrine that was taught alongside the Bible as truth. I myself was raised Southern Baptist, and at the last church I attended, this doctrine was still held with the utmost fervor. Up until the 1800s, usually wine was still being used in normal communion services. With the steady rise of the temperance movement in the United States, enter stage left Thomas Bramwell Welch. Does the name sound familiar? It should. Many Welch's juice products can be found in today's grocery markets and refrigerators around America. Thomas Bramwell Welch in 1869 developed the method of pasteurizing grape juice to halt its natural fermentation. Being a strong supporter of the temperance movement, Welch produced a non-alcoholic juice to be used for church services in his hometown of Vineland, New Jersey. As the temperance movement grew, so did the popularity of this wonder called grape juice. Today, grape juice is vacuum sealed in bottles to keep oxygen out. Once opened, the juice began to oxidize and can begin to grow harmful bacteria if it's not refrigerated. This is clearly stated today on the Welch's Juice website. On the outside of grapes, there exists natural yeast that encourages fermentation, which allows long-term storage. This natural yeast, however, also produces alcohol. The bottom line is that all wine mentioned in scripture would have contained alcohol created by fermentation. Fresh squeezed grape juice will begin to grow mold on it within a couple of days after exposure to oxygen unless it was kept cold. While there is some evidence that people could preserve the grapes whole with pitch and then squeeze the juice from them later, the clock began ticking as soon as the juice became exposed to the open air. Nobody had a refrigerator back in those days, and even cool temperatures of root cellars would not have allowed grapes to keep for very long. Once harvested in the vineyard, the grape of the vine would go to one of two places to be dried into raisins, or to the wine press to be fermented. Both of these destinations resulted in long-term storage in order to make it to consumers. Just a few years ago, there was an interesting article coming out of South Africa's wine-growing region. It stated that baboons were coming out of the jungles and eating the ripe fallen grapes in nearby vineyards. The baboons were staggering around drunk and passing out in the vineyards, making the area unsafe for vineyard workers and others in the area. You see, the falling grapes were immediately beginning to ferment under the South African sun. The fermentation is a natural process that occurs as the natural yeast on the skin of the grape begins to eat at the sugars inside, thus creating alcohol. It's a funny thought to imagine a bunch of drunk monkeys running around a vineyard, but it showcases to us a bit of science that needs to be taken into account. That being, fermentation is natural. It happens quickly. And it's the only way to preserve the juice without adding lots of added sugar, modern chemical preservatives, or running the juice through a pasteurization process. I once heard my pastor say that most of the wine mentioned in scripture was not alcoholic. He continued by saying that the water made into wine by the Messiah in John chapter 2 was non-alcoholic and anyone that says otherwise is a heretic. Let's read the text. John chapter 2 verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning sets forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. 
Anyone who has ever frequented a bar or knows someone who operates such an establishment understands that early in the evening, mixed drinks are made with more alcohol than later in the evening. As the evening progresses, the bartender will usually make the drinks with less alcohol or water them down. They do this because those in the establishment who have been drinking all evening, considered to be what the text says in verse 10 as well drunk, will tend not to notice the reduction of alcohol in the drinks, thus saving the bar owner money on the alcohol. In the industry, this is called the short pour or short pouring. It's also well known in the industry to switch out the premium higher costing alcohol or wine with lesser cheaper brand bottles. They will sometimes do this later in the evening as patrons won't notice the difference in quality after already having had a few drinks. Yet in John chapter 2, the wine is gone at the event and our Messiah turns the water to wine to make up for it. Then we see this, John chapter 2 verse 10, and said unto him, every man at the beginning sets forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. Some versions translate that last part as, save the best for last. You see, watering down drinks or serving a lower quality alcohol product in the late part of an event or evening is not a new idea to modern day bar owners or drinking establishments. This is something we see even back in the day of our Messiah. This is also proof that the wine contained alcohol. Only wine containing alcohol would be considered worthy of being wine served at the beginning of an event. That which is worse, as the King James puts it, would have been wine that would have either been watered down to make it last longer, or older wine that had started a natural turn into vinegar. Nobody had a refrigerator in those days, and so pasteurized grape juice would not have been something the average person would be familiar with at all. As with the baboons mentioned earlier, grapes can begin to ferment very quickly if not refrigerated. However, the governor of the wedding knew the difference between good wine served at the beginning of an event versus the wine that would most likely be served at the end of an event, the same way it's still being done today. Let's take a look at another New Testament example. Mark chapter 2 verse 22 proves without a doubt that our Messiah was familiar with wine containing alcohol. This verse is an analogy the Messiah used when referencing the day he would be taken away from his disciples. Let's read the verse. Mark 2 verse 22, And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Some translations use the word bottles, but in the past, they didn't use bottles for fermenting wine. They use sheep or goat skins. The skin was sewn up and the seams were sealed with pitch. The wine skin would greatly expand due to the release of carbon dioxide during the fermentation of natural yeast eating the sugars of the grape juice. This would push the leather of the wine skin to almost the bursting point. If made correctly, the skin would be able to sustain the enormous pressures created during fermentation. At a certain point, the fermenting wine would be considered finished and would then be transferred to clay bottles or wooden barrels to be kept for transportation or storage until sold or consumed. The now used wineskin would either be discarded or used for something else. It could no longer be used for fermenting wine in its weakened state. The stretched out skin could no longer handle the extreme pressures of the fermentation process and it would burst if it were attempted a second time. Our Messiah knew the process involved in making fermented wine. So much so that he even used the process as a parable as stated in Mark chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 9. This method of winemaking is mostly an art lost to history. But you can still go online today and find a few retailers and purchase truly authentic wineskins. These wineskins are more of a decorated novelty as stated by the manufacturers. They are meant to hold an already fermented wine out of a bottle so that you can reuse it over and over again. The words new wine used in the verse refers to the juice of the grape that is about to be fermented, thus putting the new skin under enormous pressures that only a new, never before used skin could handle. This simple verse, in my opinion, proves without a shadow of a doubt that our Messiah not only knew about the process of fermenting fresh juice into wine, but probably actually took part in it. Scripture is clear that the Father wants us to be sober-minded, and it's hard to do that when you drink lots of wine and strong drink. Strong drink in Scripture would seem to refer to grain-produced alcohol like vodka or whiskey. 
The Baptist ministers that I grew up with would always be quick to quote many of the verses in the Bible that seem to condemn any sort of alcohol. And there are a lot of verses that seem clear that alcohol is something we should stay away from. But we also find an enormous amount of scripture that seems to say the exact opposite. As with many things I have found in scripture that seem to have verses that contradict each other, the problem is not in scripture or a result of contradictions in the text, but instead the problem lies with pre-programmed doctrine installed by a denominational authority. Erase the man-made doctrine and the contradictions fall to the wayside. Consider the following verse, and wine that makes glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. There is nothing wrong with drinking fermented juice according to scripture. What is looked down upon is drunkenness in scripture. I have heard many pastors give heart-wrenching testimonies of families broken apart by alcohol, fathers who beat their wives or their children after drinking too much. But I have to ask myself, are these people who are beating their wives or children considering themselves children of God? Do they have a personal testimony of our Messiah? You see, I would think that if we truly have a circumcised heart like scripture says we are to have, and we truly have the desire to be a set apart people, and we truly want to walk after the footsteps of our Messiah, we should display some of the fruits of the Spirit of God, namely love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Somehow, I think a drunk beating his wife and kids has some issues with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I would submit that this type of person has a condition that extends beyond the addiction of alcohol. I would submit that this is a condition of the heart. A pastor using an example in a sermon of a man that treats his family poorly when under the influence of alcohol is just simply a poor example. Drunkenness is often referenced in scripture as something to stay away from. But I think there's a difference to being drunk and being a drunk. The Creator gives us three feasts in the year when consuming alcohol is obviously allowed. During the time of these feasts, when men and families of Israel journey to Jerusalem, with them they are to bring a few things. These include tithe for the Levites, and the poor and the widows, as well as money for themselves. That money that they save and they bring for themselves is to be used as stated in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 26. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. The feast events that the Father gives his people three times a year are to be parties, a time of rejoicing in all the blessings that he has given his obedient people. These party times are not to be an excuse for lewd behavior or lawless behavior, but these occasions that are set aside for righteous rejoicing do allow us to consume some alcohol. For a former Baptist like myself, that was an interesting revelation, and definitely it can be hard to change your position on the idea of alcohol after being convinced otherwise for so long. But like so many things that religion has fed us as doctrines of man, testing these things against what scripture says often produces a different result. My Messiah, when he was on this earth, continually railed against the traditions and doctrines of man rules that man has made up to have authority over the people they claim to shepherd over. Our Messiah is coming soon. I seriously doubt we will see Welch's grape juice produced with an unnatural man-made process called pasteurization in the coming kingdom he is bringing with him. As we wait for his coming, we need to be watchful and remain sober. But as we await the arrival of our coming king, three times a year he indeed gives us times to celebrate and rejoice in the promises the feast represent. For more videos and studies, visit our website at newtutora.com.